Look what he's done. Amen. I love that song. Can you believe what the Lord has done? Amen. Some of you have a powerful testimony of what God has done. And uh, folks see you now and they can't believe you are like you are. And you are the person that you are. Can you believe what the Lord has done? Amen. That's a, that's a good workout this morning. Amen. I tell you, I've got to gotta take a water break here just for a second. Dr. Ron worked us out today, but I think the Spirit worked us out today. Amen. Amen. It is good to rejoice and praise God and just lift Him up. And uh, if you're new to us, we, we believe in the Spirit and we believe that we can uh, worship God that way and we can clap our hands and sing and uh, all pray at the same time. We, we believe we serve a big, awesome God. He can hear everything we say and everything we're thinking. That's just how big He is, and we, we love Him this morning. We are so honored to have you with us today in our service. In 1952, on the campus of Princeton University, Albert Einstein, the great genius, was asked a question by a doctoral student. He said, what in the world is left for us to do original research on, Dr. Einstein? If we want to do an original dissertation, what can we do? Brilliant Dr. Einstein thought for a moment and finally said, find out about prayer. Somebody must find out about prayer. Fast forward to 2002 at the Duke University Medical Center. Cardiologist there by, doc, by the name of Dr. Mitch Khrushchev conducted experiments on heart patients in which he asked the question, is there a measurable incremental benefit to prayer? Dr. Khrushchev did a global study to determine if prayer made a difference in the medical realm. And in an interview with the Discovery Channel, he stated, we saw impressive reductions in all the negative outcomes of heart patients. The bad outcomes were measured in the study. What we look for routinely in cardiology trials are outcomes such as death, a heart attack, or lungs filling with water, what we call congestive heart failure in patients who are treated in the course of these problems. And then he said this about prayer. In the group randomly assigned prayer therapy, there was a 50% reduction in all complications and a 100% reduction in all major complications. Don't you love that? Prayer therapy. That's, that's good stuff right there. Then we go across the country to the West Coast at Pacific College of Medicine in San Francisco. Dr. Elizabeth Targ did a prayer study on patients who were seriously ill with AIDS. She found that 10 of the prayed for patients lived while four who had not been prayed for died. In a larger study, Dr. Targ found that people who receive prayer have six times fewer hospitalizations, and those hospitalizations were significantly shorter than the people who received no prayer. And she said this in an interview, I was shocked. Don't you love it when you pray and God shocks the doctor? I was shocked. In a way, she said, it was like witnessing a miracle. And then she said, there is no way to understand this from my experience, from my basic understanding of science. The late Chuck Colson, who was a prominent Christian observer of our culture, had to say this about these studies before he passed away just a few years ago. He says, such studies have plenty of critics but the new research has left many scratching their heads. Is prayer something that can be put under a microscope and examined? Probably not. But one thing is for sure, prayer works and prayer is real. Chuck Colson went on to say, answered prayer 
requires a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. He said it's a mysterious and unexplainable gift that God gives to those who come to him. And we don't need scientists or researchers to tell us that. Amen, Chuck Colson. For the next several weeks, we're going to talk about this mystery of prayer in the series we've entitled The Secret Place. We're going to try to answer some of the most common questions asked about prayer. And prayer is one of those things that I think that we know it when we see it, but prayer is hard to explain. And the Bible really does have a lot to say about prayer. So if you have your sermon notes, go ahead and grab those this morning, and we're going to take some notes and write some things down. I want us to look at our key verse today, which comes from Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. And this, this key verse is really a challenge for all of us who are here. And I'd like us to read this out loud together. The words are on the screen, so we'll all read the same version here this morning. But would you read it with me on the count of three? One, two, three. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Now, there are two challenges in this key verse that we just given you. Here's the first challenge. Devote yourselves to prayer. That is a challenge, to devote yourselves to prayer. Prayer is a spiritual discipline, and you have to devote yourself daily to the discipline of prayer. But now the writer gives us a second challenge, and he says, with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Two challenges in this one verse. Devote yourselves to prayer, and how do you do that? With an alert mind and with a thankful heart. Heart. So what is prayer and how do we live prayer out and how do we devote ourselves to prayer? Well, I want to give you a working definition. If you've attended this church for any length of time, you've heard me say this repeatedly about prayer, but I want to give it to you again this morning. Prayer is simply communicating with God. That is all prayer is. Prayer is communicating with God. Now, there is a lot in those three words that we're going to try to deal with this morning. We're going to look at a passage of Scripture found in Matthew chapter 6, actually verses 5 through 15 as we go throughout this sermon this morning. This is a great sermon taught by Jesus. We call it the Sermon on the Mount, and there's a lot of good information found in the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to focus what he has to say about prayer this morning. And he begins the Sermon on the Mount with these words, and now about prayer. So now we're, we're transitioning. And now, about prayer, when you pray. Now, those are some important words, and I think they're in your outline. You may want to underline those words. When you pray, not if you pray, Jesus is not questioning, does prayer work or does prayer not work? He simply says, when you pray. It's as though Jesus took for granted that his followers were going to pray. When you pray, not if you pray, not, not don't take it for granted. That, no, it, when you pray, you are going to pray. So why do we pray? Well, I want to give you an answer this morning to why we should pray and show you what happens when we pray. Here's the first thing that happens. When I pray, I prove that God exists. I prove that God exists. Prayer is an activity that says, I believe in God. I believe that God is real. I believe that when I pray that I am communicating with God. And I want you to think about that for a moment. Prayer is one of the last things in our culture that is still legitimate when it comes to issues of faith. I mean, what do you naturally assume when you see someone bow their head and pray over a meal? You assume that they are a Christian or they believe in God or they were raised in a Christian home. Even if they aren't Christians, they were taught they should pray and give thanks for their meal. That they have some kind of faith, some kind of belief in God. They believe there's something up there besides just the ceiling. And they're going to give thanks to God for the meal they're about to eat. So prayer is an issue of faith. Now there are many people in our society and in our world who call themselves atheists. And they probably really aren't atheists. 
They are probably agnostic at best. I don't think there are really any such thing as a true atheist. But there are people who say that they do not believe in God. And yet, those very people who do not believe in God or who have no faith in God, who never go to church, who never have a relationship with God, will be the first to pray when a tragedy strikes their life. I don't believe in God. I don't want anything to do with God. But now there's a tragedy Can you pray? Will you pray for me? Can you help me pray about this situation? Even people who are not Christians will pray when tragedy strikes because there is something inside of us that cries out for the eternal when the temporal is in turmoil. Something inside of us it just cries out to God, God, there's something wrong. There's something not right. There's something out of place. God, there's a tragedy in my life. This temporal life around me is in turmoil. God, I need eternal help that can only come from you. Remember the old saying from World War I, there are no atheists in foxholes. Listen, when you're out there and you're under pressure and you're taking enemy fire, whether you think there's somebody up there or not, you're going to take a shot at it, aren't you? I mean, you're going to throw up some prayer balloons. You know, God, I don't know if you're up there or not, but I'm going to try this, and I'm going to talk to you, and I'm going to communicate with you, God. I don't know if you're really there or not, but I'm throwing up some prayer balloons today, God. Why? Because you're under pressure and you're under fire, and maybe God is real, and maybe God will answer because there is this internal belief that there is God somewhere that all of us have in common. Now, it may be safe to say this morning that each of us here today believe in God. I mean, you're in church. You took time out of your schedule. You you didn't do something else that you could have been doing today. And maybe you believe that God exists. And that's not an issue at all for you here this morning. And maybe even as you sit here, you can say, Pastor Atkins, I have experienced God in my life before. I have prayed a prayer. And I have seen God answer that prayer in my life. But maybe you're here and it's been a while since you've had that encounter. It's been a while since you prayed a prayer and you've seen God answer that prayer. Or maybe you're here and, yes, you believe in God and you believe God exists and you, you've had God answer a prayer. But for some reason you feel a little far or distant from God today. Well, I hope you'll be reminded as we go throughout this series that God exists, and that God does care about you, and that God wants to have a daily connection with you. So prayer proves that God exists, and Jesus reminds us that prayer should be a common occurrence in the believer's life and not the exception in the believer's life. And because it is so common, our encounters with God do not, do not have to be the ones of theological high-mindedness or philosophical language. In fact, look at what Jesus says about the language of prayer. He says, and now about prayer. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues or wherever everyone can see them. I assure you, Jesus says, that is all the reward they will ever get. Now here's just a little context of this passage. In Jesus' day, the very religious people would go on a street corner, literally, and stand and pray loud, very public prayers and use very theological language and flowery words, and it would draw attention to themselves. And what it would do for those passing by, as they looked at them, they would say, that is a very religious person. Look at how they pray. Listen to the words they say. Look at the dress they have on while they're praying. That is a very religious person. But it also said this, the person standing there praying that prayer for everyone to hear was just a little bit better than the person walking down the street listening and watching them pray. I'm just a little bit better than you are. Because of how I pray and because of how I act. Well, Jesus called those people hypocrites. They're hypocrites. In fact, that word hypocrite simply means to wear a mask. 
It's simply acting. It's an actor on a stage pretending to be somebody or something that they really aren't. And Jesus said, this is not prayer at all. Prayer is not about flowery language and impressing people with your words. Prayer is about connecting with God. And prayer is saying, God, I'm coming to seek you. I'm coming to know you. I'm praying, God, because I believe you exist. And if nobody hears me, and nobody sees me, and nobody knows I do it, God, it doesn't matter. I believe you exist. God, I want to connect to you. God, I need to talk to you now. And I don't need anybody around me to talk to you. And Jesus said something amazing in return would happen. In those days, when you pray, I will listen. Now, let me stop there for one second. We all like to have people listen to us when we talk, don't we? Well, you know, we have something important to say. We have something to add to the conversation. We have something that is just going to be so profound. Everyone should listen to everything we have to say. And doesn't it just get under your skin a little bit when you're trying to tell that person something and they're not listening to you? Or uh, what, what, what what'd you say? Were you talking to me? Or the, my number one thing that irritates me is I'm talking to somebody and I'm trying to even respond sometimes, and they turn around and walk away from me. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not wasting my time on you anymore. Jesus said, in those days when you pray, I, Jesus, will listen to that prayer. Isn't that powerful? Doesn't that make you want to stop and think, man, maybe I ought to take my prayer a little more seriously? I ought to really rethink my prayer life. I should really rethink how I communicate with God. I should really rethink my attitude about prayer because Jesus said in those days when you pray, I will listen to that prayer. I can't think of anybody better in the universe to listen to your prayers than Jesus himself. God said, I'll listen to you when you pray. If you look for me in earnest, what will happen? You will find me when you seek me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. What is God saying? God says, I can be found. I'm not hiding from you. This is not hide and seek. That's not the relationship God wants to have with us. God isn't hiding somewhere trying to avoid you and trying to make you search and search and search. God says, no, when you pray to me, I will listen to you and I can be found. It, 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 let me just say this. It goes in hand in hand with what we're studying on Wednesday nights, the book of Revelation, the agents of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he wants us to understand what that book has to say about it. And he reveals himself in that book. God says, I can be found in that day when you pray to me. So prayer, first and foremost, proves that God exists. Secondly, when I pray, I reconnect with my heavenly Father. Now let me give you a little theological lesson here on prayer. There are lots of questions that people have about prayer. And we'll try to answer some of those as we go through the series, as we've already said. But prayer all begins with an understanding of what Jesus did for us on the cross through his death, through his burial, and through his resurrection. As Christians, we just came out of a holy season we call Christmas. We came out of that season, we celebrate. We know it wasn't the day Jesus was born. We, we get all of that. But we celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we come out of that season a few weeks ago, and believe it or not, in just about 11 weeks, we'll be in the holy season of Easter, and we'll celebrate his resurrection. Amen. Only 11 weeks from now. It's hard to believe that. So we come out of one holy season, and we go right into the next holy season. And one reason that this is such a pivotal event for Christians is because had Jesus not come to earth at Christmas, lived his life, died, been buried, been resurrected back to heaven, then we could not connect with God at all. His life, death, burial, and resurrection gives us a connection with God. See, before Jesus came, 
people could only propose that God might be out there. They could only propose that there might be a way to connect with God. We could only presume that, yes, there was a God, and we could know him. And we know that God did make himself known through the prophets and the law in the Old Testament. But it was impossible before Jesus came, lived, died, was buried, and was resurrected for human beings individually to connect with God. There was no connection there. There was a national connection with the nation of Israel where the nation was connected to God, but there was no individual connection with God that we could have before Jesus came. You see how this connects us back to God? So when Jesus came, it changed everything because Jesus came as 100% God, and he took on the form of 100% human. Jesus brought God and humanity together just like this. That's what he did. He brought God and humanity together. He connected us to God. Jesus is our only connection to God. He started the process for you and for me to have a friendship and an ongoing relationship with God. And notice in your notes we gave you the word reconnect because prayer is not our initial connection with God. Our initial connection to God comes through a relationship through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's when we are connected to God. But in order for us to maintain that connection, we have to reconnect on a daily basis through prayer. So I'm connected to God when I'm saved, when I'm born again, but now I maintain that connection how? Through prayer. Prayer reconnects me back to God. See, this is this business of thinking, well, I'm saved and I'm satisfied and I got it all. No, no, no. You have to stay connected to God. You got to reconnect to God daily, on a daily basis, and we do that through prayer. So when Jesus says, and now about prayer, he is talking to those who are followers of his. Because the followers of Jesus are the ones who can reconnect to God over and over again. Prayer maintains that relationship. Look at what the Bible says. And now about prayer. When you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father secretly. Then your Father who knows all secrets will reward you. The word Father that Jesus uses is Abba. That's a very intimate term. It's the equivalent of what you might call your own earthly dad. Now, I know some of you may have had a strained relationship with your father. Maybe your father was nowhere to be found. But some of you had a really good relationship with your fathers, didn't you? And you had a term, a phrase, a word, however you want to say it, that you may have called your father. Maybe it was dad. Maybe it was daddy. Maybe it was pop or pops. Papa. I don't know. What, whatever it was. Called him something. And what was that? It was a term a word of endearment it was intimate you knew what it mean he knew what it mean when you heard that word the same kind of word that Jesus uses here defines the relationship that we can have with our Heavenly Father it's not just my father he's my dad and, and when I'm younger our kids would call us daddy he's my daddy brother john it's intimate it's loving it's caring it's not this picture that we have in our minds in western christianity where god is sitting on this huge humongous throne just waiting to zap us and destroy us and and get rid of us and that he's always angry at us and he's always mad at us and listen, some of you grew up in a church culture like that. God was always angry. He was always disappointed in you. You always failed him and you always let him down. And you can never do anything right. But no, Jesus said, he's our Abba. He's our Father. He loves us. And he cares about us. So much that you can have this intimate relationship with him. 
And yes, you connected him through believing that Jesus died on the cross and was raised again. And he asked him into your heart. But you reconnect with him every day. And you have that relationship with your dad, your Abba, your father, your pops. You know, I just have to believe if you want to call God pops, I think you'd be all right with that. Because it's intimate. It's sincere. If you want to call him the big guy, I think he'd be all right with that. Because it's intimate and it's sincere. And Jesus says, that's how I want you to connect with him. When you pray, go away and shut that door and talk to your father who loves you and cares about you. Can I just say this about our prayer times during the week that we have here? When I walk in the very front doors out there the music is playing and the tone is set when I hit the door and when I walk in here the lights are down the music's playing softly and I feel a connection to my father my heavenly father but you know what I don't have to be in a church to feel that I can feel that connection in my car in my house on my job while I'm playing sports Wherever it is I'm doing, I can feel that connection to my father, my Abba, my dad, my pops. I can feel that connection to him. I put in your notes a question, how often do I need to be to reconnect with God? Here's the answer, daily. We need to reconnect to God daily in our lives. So I prove that God exists when I pray. I reconnect with my Heavenly Father when I pray. Thirdly, I admit my dependence on Him when I pray. Prayer is an act of admittance. Prayer can contain confession. Prayer can contain praise. It can contain thanksgiving. It can contain supplication. But ultimately, prayer is an admission to God that you cannot do this alone. But listen, prayer is not about showing that God is available to you. Prayer is about showing that you are available to God. Prayer is saying, God, I'm available for you to work in my life, and I'm available for you to do your will in my life. Look at our next passage. And now about prayer. When you pray, don't babble on and on as other people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered only by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. Because your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. There's that issue again. If God already knows what we need, if he already knows our secrets, why does he want us to pray in the first place? You see, we aren't asking and praying for God's sake. We are asking and praying for our sake. Let me say it this way. Prayer was not invented for God. Prayer was invented for us. That's what prayer is. You're not doing God any favors by praying. He invented prayer for you and for me so that we can reconnect to him. That's why prayer exists, so we can reconnect to God. So if prayer is an act of admission on our part, we say, God, I need you in my life. God already knows you need him. God will not move in your life, however, until you open the door and allow him to come in. So this is where that cooperation happens and the connection that you have to have. God knows, and let me say this, I believe this this morning, if you're sitting here, God knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly what you need. He knows every worry, every problem, every fear, every situation. He knows every trouble you have. He knows all the financial problems you got. He knows all the, the job-related issues you have. He knows all the health issues you have. But God will not force his way into your life, and God will not do anything in your life until you reconnect to him through prayer. And prayer opens the doorway. Now God has all the blessing, God has all the power, God has all the miracle, God has all the resources, but until you reconnect with him through prayer, he is not going to force himself into your life. Now let me talk about a couple of things that this passage points out. As I've already said, when you pray, you do not have to use flowery language or spiritual language when talking to God. I, I think some people who were raised in church 
I only think God speaks in the King James language. But, you know, God doesn't speak in the King James language. Just, you know, heads up for that. Thou, O oh, gracious and mightiest being. And the King James is beautiful language, man. That is some good stuff. And every time I quote a scripture, it's always from the King James because that's what I grew up on. But I don't have to pray to God in the King James language. I mean, that's just 1611 that you're reading. You know, how did people communicate to God before that came along? So I don't have to just quote King James and talk in that kind of language to God. But it also points out something that I think is very important. Jesus says that we should not repeat the same words over and over and over and over and over and over and over over again. You've heard people pray. You've been at the altar. You've been standing near somebody. You've been with somebody somewhere. And they said God's name 3,000 times in that prayer. Every other word was God. God, God, God. And Jesus said, you don't have to say the words over and over and over and over again. This is how it sounds. Most likely after church today, we're going to go out and eat something. And we're going to sit at the table. My daughter Ashley is here. And I didn't tell her I was going to pick on her, but I will pick on her today. Her name is Ashley. And wouldn't it sound bizarre if we sat down to eat and I say, Ashley, how do you like your dinner today? Ashley, how does your food taste? Ashley, isn't the carpet in this restaurant very dirty today, Ashley? Ashley, what time is it? Ashley, would you like to watch TV after we eat lunch today, Ashley? Ashley, what do you want to do today? Ashley, what do you want to do tonight, Ashley? Doesn't that sound bizarre to just keep saying Ashley over and over and over again? Because I know her name is Ashley and she knows her name is Ashley, right? Just sounds bizarre to keep saying that over and over again. Now, and many times when we talk to God, we do that. I've done that. We fall into this mantra of saying God's name over and over and over again. And it's not really a negative thing, and the person doing it doesn't mean anything wrong by it. They're not doing anything evil by doing that. But it's just a crutch that we lean on because you can't think of anything else to say. And so we just say God. And we just lean on that. And you know what it does? It helps us keep the prayer moving along. That's all it does. When we can't think of anything else to say, we just, God. And it moves the prayer along. Let me give you a tip this morning. One of the best things that you can do in the discipline of prayer is to practice silence when you're praying. Just be quiet sometimes. Stop talking. Stop saying anything. Stop trying to move the prayer along. See, when you pray, instead of repeating God's name over and moving to the next sentence and repeating his name and moving to the next sentence, let some silence be built into that time and be quiet before God. Let the conversation happen when you're praying. And don't feel like you have to fill every moment of prayer with your words. Jesus even said, be still and know that I am God. Be quiet every now and then. Let me talk to you. Let me speak to your spirit. Let me me speak into your life and into your being, and, and let me tell you some things. But if you talk all the time, you can't hear me talking back to you. You've got to be quiet and listen to me speak. And you know what I think will happen if we will stop trying to move the prayer along and move the prayer along and move the prayer along? If we will stop and be silent and let God speak to us, you know what I think will happen? As we reconnect to God, there will be a deeper intimacy in that connection. Because I'm not just trying to fill time, but I really want to connect with God again on a deeper level. Now, look at our memory verse from Matthew 7 and 7. Here's what it says. Keep on asking, and you will be given what you ask for. Keep on looking, and you will find Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened. Prayer. Charles Allen, the great devotional writer, said, Prayer is not a means by which I seek to control God. It is a means of putting myself in a position where God can control me. That's what prayer is. You know, we got this thing mixed up, some people in the church world, where we're trying to control God with our prayer. And he's going to do whatever I say and however I say and whenever I say and do what I tell him to do. No, no, no. Prayer is not about me controlling God. Prayer is about God controlling me and my life. 
I'm not in control of this thing. God is in control of my life. And so when I pray, I prove that God exists. I reconnect with my Heavenly Father. I, I admit my dependence on Him. And finally, I yield my will to God's will. This last point is ultimately what prayer is all about. God already knows what you need. God already knows what is the best possible life for you. He already knows what areas that you need to work on or to adjust in your life. And that is really the ultimate action of prayer. Is God adjusting my life and changing my life. How many of you are familiar with the Lord's Prayer? We're going to look at that throughout this series a little bit. But I wanted us to read this as a group this morning. And I don't want you just to read it. I want you to, to say it as a prayer. And, and this translation may be a little different than what you grew up learning. And that's fine. That it's going to be on the screen for us all. But I want us to read this Lord's Prayer together. Would you do that this morning? On the count of three. One, two, three. In this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What a beautiful prayer Jesus gave us. This is the model prayer from Jesus himself. And if you look at the very first part of that passage, Gail, could you go back one slide this morning? Jesus said, in this manner, therefore, pray. In this manner. He did not say, mimic this prayer. He did not say, repeat this prayer over and over and over again. He said, in this manner, pray. Now, I'm going to say something, and don't throw the, the tomatoes at me just yet. There is nothing magical about the specific words of this prayer. Nothing magical about them. Jesus simply said, this is a manner of praying. Yes, it's a beautiful prayer. Yes, we've taught it to our children. Yes, we still say it at funerals and other special occasions. Yes, we still use this prayer by Jesus. But it is nothing special. There's nothing magical about the specific words of this prayer. And I won't spend a lot of time on this today, but there are seven petitions in the Lord's Prayer. And look at the third petition, what it says. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. Not my will be done. How many know that you have a will? Yeah, you have a human will. And there are things that you want to do and things that you want done, and you want them done a certain way. That is your human will. We all have that in here. But Jesus said, when you pray, you have to pray, not my will be done, but your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Aldous Huxley said, the third petition of the Lord's Prayer is repeated daily by millions who have not the slightest intention of letting anyone's will be done but their own. I said this a few weeks ago, you can sing a lie as well as tell a lie. Well, let's say it this way today, you can pray a lie as well as tell a lie too, can't you? Millions of people, this holy day of Sunday, all across the world, millions of people in different churches have said this exact prayer, the Lord's Prayer, and they have said those words, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And millions of them, and some of us included perhaps, have no intention of letting anyone's will be done but our own will. We're not going to let God's will be done. Surrender that, surrender my will, surrender my thoughts, surrender my dreams and hopes and aspirations. You've got to be kidding me. I don't know. Not God, my will be done. And yet we will repeat this prayer over and over and over and over and over again. And we never intend to let God's will take precedence over our will. Let me ask you a question this morning. What area of your life do you need to surrender to God's will? 
Maybe it's your career, maybe it's your finances, maybe it's your relationships or your talents or your gifts. I don't know what it is this morning. Famed Holocaust survivor Corey Tinboom asked this question in one of her books. Is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Which one is it? You know what a spare tire is. You pull it out when you need it, right? You don't think about that thing. If you're like 99% of us, you don't think about that spare tire in the trunk of the car up underneath the truck. When you need it, you hope it's got air in it, right? And you think, I ought to check this thing every once in a while. Once a year, I ought to check this thing. Make sure it's even. I went to change a tire one time. Somebody stole my spare tire. It was gone. Hey, cut it out from under the truck. Gone, missing. And I wonder sometimes if we don't <laughs> go to pray sometimes if somebody stole the spare tire. The power is gone. The prayer is gone. The intimacy is gone. Some of us haven't talked to Abba, Father, Dad in so long. There's no connection there any longer, hardly. He hardly knows our voice, hardly knows what we sound like. The only time we talk and cry out is when we need a spare tire. Something's happened in life. Something bad has happened. We're sick. Our kids are sick. We're out of money. We need a job. Then we dig around for the spare tire and pull it out. Just like people who come to church. They don't come to church for six months and then something bad happens in life. And then they, You know what church is? Church is another one of those spare tires people have. Oh, I got to get in church now. I got to get myself right, Pastor. I'm going to read my Bible and pray my prayers. I'm going to give in that arm. I'm going to pay some tithes. And then when God shows up and God has mercy and grace on us, they just flitter right back out the doors again until they need a spare tire again. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure God gets sick of being the spare tire and getting kicked around. You only pull them out when you need them. So is prayer your steering wheel? Is it driving your life? Is it directing your life? Is it going where you, God wants you to go? Have you said, God, not my will, but your will be done? When you can pray that prayer and mean it and say those words and mean it, then you know prayer is now your steering wheel and it's no longer a spare tire for you. Jesus said this, Abba, Father, you can do all things. He prayed this right before he was crucified. Take this cup of suffering, but do what you want, not what I want. I wonder if you could say those last line this morning. But do what you want and not what I want. Can I just be honest? I've got some things in my life that I just that I just want to do. Some things I want to accomplish and some things I want to see happen. But if it's not what God wants, then I don't want it in my life. Some of you sitting here right now, we got a bunch of our college kids home right now, and they got a plan. Thank God they got a plan. Some of you parents are like, man, you're paying for this thing. You're trying to get it, get it going on. And they got a plan for their life. But you know what? Their plan may not be God's plan for their life. And all your hopes and dreams and aspirations that you had for your children, it may not be what God has for them in their life. I pray this over my own children. God, not their will be done, but your will be done in their lives. And that's a tough prayer to pray sometimes. You know why? It's hard to, to give in the steering wheel, isn't it? Hard to pass it over. Some of you train your kids how to drive. You taught them how to drive. And you sit in that passenger seat. And how many times did you hear? How many times you reach over and grab that steering wheel? And I tell them, we'll come into church like this and we have a service and say, God, here's the steering wheel of my life. And then we leave here and this whole week we'll be hitting the brakes. And we'll be grabbing at the steering wheel. No, not my will, Lord. Yours be done. Some of you worried about jobs. You worried, should you transfer? Should you change jobs? Should you move out of this neighborhood to another neighborhood? Should you buy that house or should you buy that car? 
listen, I believe God cares about every part of your life. Every detail of it. He cares about it. Not my will, Lord. Your will be done. I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads with me this morning. I know in a crowd this size there are their needs. And I just want to tell you this morning, God cares about it. We got a family here near the front of the church this morning. They got a little grandbaby and a little nephew in the hospital. His parents come to our church. His name is Hunter. Hunter was born just a few days ago and born with a hole in his lung. That's closed up now, but he can't get the fluid off his lungs now. Just a few days old. But I believe God could touch that little baby, the, that NICU this morning. You believe that? I believe that today. That God is able to touch him. And just as I believe God can touch that little baby, I believe God can touch you in your life and meet your needs. If you will take the steering wheel of your life and just hand it off to him and say, Okay, God, not my will. Your will be done in my life. I give it to you. Is there something in your life this morning that you need to pass off to God and say, okay, Lord, I've tried it my way. I've done it my way. I've tried long enough. But my, my career is yours. My finances are yours. My friendships are yours. My whatever is yours. And God, I'm just releasing it to you today. And prayer will no longer be a spare tire for me. But God, it will be the steering wheel and the driving force of my life. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. I'm not going to do anything like that today. But if you need prayer and you need to reconnect with your Heavenly Father this morning, your dad, your pop, whatever you call him, if you want to reconnect this morning, I'm just going to invite you to come to this altar and pray right now. It's just a sign of I'm reconnecting. It's open now. You want to come? I'm not going to drag this out. But I think some of us just need to reconnect with our dad today.